all this is dr mubeen sayed from drbean.com welcome to one more show so there is a um, renewed interest in understanding pain what is pain what is chronic pain how does chronic pain actually become chronic you may have noticed that in in many of us who have chronic pain the actual stimulus of the pain the cause of the pain may have actually disappeared but the pain continues so what is the re reason for the chronic pain then how do we manage the pain especially when there is a, a more reservation for using opioids what are the other alternatives like naltrexone and others so there is a lot to understand in pain and uh, let's look at our first lecture in this series today what we'll talk about is what is pain the definition of pain the uh receptors that are for pain and how do they work and what kind of uh triggers can cause pain then what is the pain pathway which is called the major pathway is called lateral spinothalamic pathway how do we sense pain in our brain or where do the pain fibers go and connect and finally what are the modulating pathways for the pain so i will not go too much in detail for the modulating pathways because we do not have enough time but i'm going to talk about the neurotransmitters that are involved in modulation of pain or kind of altering the sensation of pain pain can actually be sometimes altered even to the point of completely getting gated you may have noticed that when you are happy or when you are playing games uh, even if there is a painful stimuli for example sometimes playing games can cause an injury and the sensation or the perception of pain is reduced it is not just that we are because we are happy or because we are playing games somehow we we would decide not to feel pain our body is actively releasing encephalines or endorphins the internal opioid system which can help reduce the pain or modulate the pain downwards similarly when the pain signal is too intense and the body think that we would not be able to handle it very well maybe we'll get a heart attack or some other uh, thing that would cause severe damage to us in that case body can completely gate pain there are people who would say that my limb was blown off and i did not even know there was no pain at that time and the reason was that the pain got gated so there is a lot to talk about pain this is the first lecture we're going to do a mini series and handle pain and its uh, associated uh, clinical uh concepts so let's start so these are gifts for humanity they're continuing and here is the quick references to the uh, various lectures so I'll come to dr bean in a second uh references for example here the epidemiology of the pain in the us during 2021 20.9% of the US population had adults had chronic pain so out of 330 million 80 million are children so we are talking 250 million and then there were about 51.6 million that had chronic pain and 17.1 million people had high intensity chronic pain that's a huge uh number and then on top of that with the pandemic you know that there is prevalence of pain that has increased so this is pain's epidemiology then here there are some more um references this is the revised iasp definition of pain and we're going to talk about that i just want to give you a quick look this is the acid acid sensing ion channels for pain then this is a very good article about pain some more good articles these um these are present the links are present in the description as well and of course on drbean.com i have been handling uh, pain receptors general sensory receptors then the uh, nerve fibers various tracks in neurology that is all covered so i just wanted to quickly show you here is a sensory receptors in in skin i had done a webinar in the past and that covers pain receptors too i would cover those once again today as well and then on top of this here is a good news this is drbean.com this is just for 
this weekend, today and this weekend. I accidentally thought today is Black Friday. So I asked my team to just make this one time access again for $67 and um, black friday is actually next month so anyways take advantage of this one if you look at the actual pricing we have moved away from the um, one-time prices so if you see for students it is 19.99 per month and for cme purchasers it is going to be 600 dollars a year or 70 dollars a month so this this is a huge benefit and we'll take it uh, you will take it down on this monday Okay, so with these references, uh, the link to this one is also in the description. With these references, let's start with my drawings. So first, definition of ping. The current IASP definition of ping, so that is the group that is uh, that defines and and decides what the pain is an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with actual or potential tissue damage or described in terms of such damage so please realize it is not necessary that we always have to have some so sort of a physiological problem some sort of a physical issue to have pain Pain can be, number one, it is always subjective. And number two, pain can be without tissue damage. And as I said before, it is possible that tissue damage started the pain and then the pain stayed and the tissue damage went away. And that became chronic. And we would talk in detail in the future lectures that how does pain become chronic? And it is important for us to have today's uh, foundations under our belt. So, and please remember, by definition, a perception of pain, even without physical um, evidence of any physical damage, should be treated as pain, should be agreed and accepted as pain. You can tell the patient that, hey, you have pain, but there is, I do not see any physical evidence of the cause of the pain, so you don't have pain. Okay, so an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with actual or potential tissue damage or described in terms of such damage. This was the definition that was created in 1979. Then in 2018, the IASP, that is the uh, body that works on the pain um, definition. So let me just very quickly show it to you. This is the Association of the Study of Pain, IASP. So what they did was in 2018, they had another 14 member task force whose, whose job was to make sure that if there is any more knowledge that we have gathered since 1979 about pain, then they should go and update the pain definition. So they, within, they worked on it for two years and then they proposed a definition and so the definition that is now accepted i think it got accepted in 2021 that definition is an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with or resembling that associated with actual or potential tissue damage actual or potential tissue damage pain actually most of the time pain would start occurring before the tissue damage occurs because it tries to tell you that tissue damage is going to happen. So it warns you before the damage. This is why it is not necessary that actual damage is there to have pain. Secondly, pain is a very interesting sensation or noxious uh, sensation that unlike other senses, Pain, when felt, if you do not manage it, pain's perception will continue to increase. The body will try to keep the pain present and increase the stimulus so the, or increase the intensity so that you manage it. Most of the other sensations, for example, if you're wearing clothes and the clothes were touching you when you were wearing them, you were aware of them when you were wearing the clothes. But afterwards, you become adapted to them. The, the receptors for those touch and light pressure, they become adapted and you don't even know that I'm wearing clothes. Pain will not go away. If you have a tiny injury somewhere, that injury would keep giving you pain 
until you manage it. Now, the definition of, definition of the pain on, also has this box or the note that is associated with it. So there are some very interesting points of this note, and I wanted to make sure that we can see them. So if you see here, pain is always subjective. Each individual learns the application of the word through experience related to injury in early life. All of us learn what pain is. Because of that, all of our perception of pain is different. Biologists rec recognize that those stimuli which cause pain are liable to tissue damage or damaged tissue. Accordingly, pain is the experience, is that experience which we associate with actual or potential tissue damage. It is unquestionably a sensation in part in a part or parts of the body, but it is also always unpleasant and therefore also an emotional experience. This is very important. Pain always have an ex emotional experience. So to tell the patient that this is in your head is actually a very, it's not the best way to manage a patient. So experience which resembles pain, for example, for example, pricking, but are not unpleasant should not be called pain. Unpleasant abnormal experiences, dysesthesias, may also be pain but are not necessarily so because subjectively they may not have the usual sensory qualities of pain. Then many people report pain in the absence of tissue damage or any likely pathophysiological cause. Pathophysiological mean me mechanical or abnormal uh, thing happening with the body pathophysiological cause, usually this happens for psychological reasons. There is no way to distinguish their experience from that due to tissue damage if we take the subjective report. If they regard their experience as pain and if they report it in the same ways as pain caused by tissue damage, it should be accepted as pain. This is a very important point. Okay, so continuing. So now the question is, where is pain felt? When you have pain, let's say you have a small injury at the tip of your finger or at your big toe, you stubbed it. Is the pain in the toe or is the pain in the brain or somewhere else? So it is going to be all of the above. So pain, of course, will originate by the tissue stress or tissue damage from the area wherever the tissue is in distress, for example, big toe in our example. But the perception of pain is in the higher centers. So here I have a quick uh, sensory homunculus here. Homunculus, our brain has our body's representation in it. And the pain sensation, for example, let's say from, from the big toe, this looks like a finger, so let's say big toe, the nerve fibers from the big toe will come and attach here where the big toe is represented in the brain. And so when there is a pain stimulus in the big toe and that comes and connects here in the cortex, what cortex does, this is called the law of projection, that cortex will make you feel pain in the area of big toe. You will not feel pain in the head for the big toe although head or the brain is the one that is creating the perception of pain, but there is a thing called law of projection in physiology. What that means is that brain will have us feel whatever sense we are feeling in the appropriate location and brain can project us to that location. So this is the representation of our body. If you see here for pain, our motor homunculus is, or homunculus is different our sensory homunculus is different. So if you see here, our sensory homunculus from inside of the brain towards outer side is, first of all here, this is, these are genitalia. Can you imagine that these are genitalia versus this is hand? Our sensation in lips, tip of the nose, hands, is the most uh, intense and most densely represented in the brain compared to, for example, back of our, uh, our back. So here, this is genitalia. Then this is the representation of feet. Then this is calf, thigh. This is head, 
without the uh, features because features are over here. This is head and neck and shoulder and back. Then this is arm. This is hand. Hand has a larger representation because lots of sensory fibers or pain would come from hand and other senses as well. So this is a sensory homunculus, not just pain homunculus. So sensory fibers are here, then eye, nose, and if you see here, lips have a very large representation. Now, of course, this is an area where pain will be perceived or processed and then projected to wherever the pain should be. And as you heard before in this talk, pain is a an unpleasant uh, uh, sensation. So our limbic system will take part in this as well. Our reticular formation is part of our tissue, brain tissues, reticular formation takes part in it. Uh, some parts of our medulla where reticular formation is midbrain where reticular formation is then the lower centers thalamus thalamus is the most uh, is the headquarters of sensations including the uh, pain sensation as well so thalamus would receive it limbic system will receive it limbic system is our emotional brain of the older type and its job one of its job is to judge every sensation to say, I like it, or I do not like it, or I do not care about it. If it does not like something, or if it likes something, it will then try to remember it, and it will then try to create an emotion about it. So whenever there is pain, limbic system would step in to help us produce an emotion around that pain. And it is always unpleasant. So then the question is, how does pain stimulus start? So now please pay attention. We are getting into the anatomy and physiology of the pain system. This will be very important for the future discussion when we'll talk about pain modulation and we'll talk about drugs or substances that would help with pain. So here, this is a piece of skin. Now remember, pain can trigger from almost any part of our body. However, our skin, muscles, tendons, bones, they have more uh, representation of pain and they have more pain nerve endings compared to our visceras. The uh, visceras actually can have no pain, but still visceras, when there is a large amount of damage done to a viscera, for example, heart attack, we do feel pain. And secondly, uh, GIT, we feel pain as well. Secondly, visceras, visceras are, are organs. Visceras have layers on them. And those layers that are covering the visceras can feel pain as well. So here, let's say, I'm just going to use skin in our example. Here is skin. And if you see here, there are three fibers that you can see. This is one nerve fiber, this is another nerve fiber, and this is one more nerve fiber. So let me make it a little bigger. So let's start from this one. Pain is carried by two kinds of nerve fibers. C fibers, C fiber, this is the one down here. They are the thinnest fibers. They are not myelinated, and they have slow travel of the pain action potential through them. Action potential is the the wave of electrical activity going through the nerve all the way to the brain and the other parts of the nervous tissue. So action potentials will be that wave or the traveling of the wave. Action potential is just one part or one, one incidence of that wave and it travels then. So here is the nerve. C fibers have the the sensation travel through them at one meter per second. So they're slowest, one of the very slow fibers. And the reason is the chronic pains, for example, or pain itself, other than acute pain, pain usually just would stay there for a longer period of time. So you don't need a very fast pain fiber. You just need a dull, achy pain that is just there for hours and days and months and years. So body doesn't have a lot of resources with this kind of a pain. It just knows it's going to keep coming in. So C fibers are slow fibers. 
The receptor for the pain, as you can see here, these are called free nerve endings. That means that, that the nerve, when it reaches near the tissue where it is going to give off its receptors, it just divides into a bunch of uh, nerve fibers and their ends, free nerve ends will act as pain receptors. Then if you see here, this nerve is a delta fiber. A delta fiber is still a slim fiber. It is it has a small diameter, but it is uh, myelinated. So the nerve impulse travel is actually faster in it. So two to 10 meter per second. It also has free nerve endings as its receptor. And then something related to pain is the touch and pressure and vibration sensations. So you might say that, well, touch, pressure, vibration are not pain. You are correct. However, these sensations can modulate pain. What that means is that when pain is occurring, the presence of touch and pressure or vibration or even electrical stimuli in that area can actually modulate the pain usually downwards. So this is actually a touch pressure fiber. It has this little Pacinian corpuscle at the end that is the receptor. This is a beta fiber. Its speed is high. The touch and pressure for us is a very uh, high velocity sensation. We, You don't want to have somewhere a touch is present and you find out three seconds later that you cannot afford, but pain can continue on for a long time. So 30 to 70 meter per second is the velocity. And the reason I have put that over here, this itself is not a pain uh, fiber, but it modulates the pain fibers from the same area. Okay, so now the big question, how does the pain occur or what causes the pain? So here I have a free nerve ending. So some folks were saying, is this a thumb? So this is a free nerve ending. Imagine we have gone thousands of times closer to the nerve and this is the nerve ending. Eventually, in our nervous system, it really not is the nerve or the nerve ending that defines that this is going to be the pain. It is where the nerve is hooked. How can I give you an example for that? Imagine we have electrical system. Our electrical wire themselves are not for fans or lights or computers or TVs. It is really wherever that wire is plugged, whatever that wire is plugged into, it is the device that would decide what is the action of electricity over there. So a wire that is connected into a light will cause the light to turn on. So you can't say that this is this wire causes light. The wire is just electrical, you know, relay system. Similarly, if there is a wire that is connected into a refrigerator, so that would cause the refrigerator to run and things to cool down. But you can't say that this wire causes the cooling. The wire is still just the electrical system. Similarly, in our body, the nerves themselves are nothing but electrical relays. However, where do they go in the brain and where do they connect will decide what feeling we have. You could experimentally, in theory, you could take a nerve from foot, which is connecting here to the foot area in the brain, and disconnect it from here and reconnect it to the hand. And now if there is a sensation in the foot, that would cause a sensation actually to be perceived in the hand. This is also why the phantom limbs and people do not have a limb and they still say, I feel pain in my hand or I, I feel that I have closed my hand and I have no way to open it because there is no hand, but I still feel the pain and the grip of the hand. That is because brain that area is getting triggered by their uh, neuroma present at the skin where the limb got cut off or amputated. And that sensation from there is projecting into the uh, hand area or foot area and they're feeling pain or sensation in those areas. So really it is the, where is the wire connected that does the decision, not the wire itself. So here, this part is a transducer. A transducer is something that converts one kind of a message to another kind of a message, one kind of energy to another kind of energy. For example, I have created this little candle over here. We have pain receptors that will become triggered by heat. 
Now, also, I want to say it is not necessary just uh, like I have made over here that one recept one nerve ending has all receptors on it for pain. Various nerve endings have various receptors. I just put them on one ending that anatomically is wrong. So here we have a free nerve ending. And imagine we have a special protein here. This protein, which I depicted as a candle, it really is not a candle, right? This protein can become changed with heat or with cold. So normally greater than 45 degrees centigrade or lesser than, I believe, minus 5 degree centigrade will cause pain. Pain receptors usually have a very high threshold. They don't just willy-nilly start getting triggered. And if that happens, we'll be in trouble because everything will start feeling like pain. So here, this is a protein which with temperature changes its shape. And when that shape is changed, that protein will open up and will allow the calcium, or sorry, sodium ions to get in. In our nerves, the action potential or that, that trigger or the impulse will travel when the sodium channels will open up and the sodium will get in. This is a complex uh, discussion to talk about action potential that would have its own um, lectures and I have done them on, doc on Dr. Bean. Here, just let's just live with this much that with the heat, this protein will change its shape and that would allow this uh, area to open up and there is a sodium channel here and the sodium will get in and an impulse would start. That impulse would then go and connect in the brain. Similarly, for example, let's say this is a another protein that can change its shape because of the presence of some chemicals, for example, serotonin or bradykinin or histamine. And as it changes the shape and that causes the sodium channel to become open and sodium go in, we will then feel pain. Similarly, for example, prostaglandins or PGE2, these prostaglandins are chemicals that are released in the damaged tissue. And once again, what they do is they'll open up the sodium channels and the sodium will get in and action potential would occur. Very interesting three things I wanna talk about here. Number one, if you see this little hole I have made, this one, this is a mechanical pain system, <laughs> transducer. Really imagine if we have a balloon and that balloon has tiny pin pricks in it. So if the balloon is collapsed, it doesn't have air, those pin pricks, you can't even see them. But if you kind of stretch that balloon, then these pin pricks will become larger holes and those would allow then the calcium to get in. So this is a mechanical pain receptor. Similarly, hydrogen ions, acidity. Acidity causes pain. This is why when we have our muscular pains, there are many reasons for the muscular pain. One of the reason is uh, collection, accumulation of lactic acid. Lactic acid, causes mus muscle tension to increase and that further causes pain. Plus hydrogen ions can actually open up sodium channels. There are hydrogen sensing sodium channels. So this is a sodium channel and it senses hydrogen in the environment. So when the pH goes down, that means hydrogen ions are more, they would open up this channel, the channel would open and the pain sensation would start acidity causes pain for with many reasons by tissue damage by muscle to tone increase by causing direct effect on the sodium channels to open them then another very important um, pain causing substance is atp i'm sure that you are aware that atp adenosine triphosphate is used by all all of our cells to perform their functions it is the currency of, uh, of function in our body. Anything that is gonna work is gonna say, give me ATP and then I'll work. So our body has figured out that if ever ATP is spilled in the environment, that means some cell is broken. There is some damage to some cell. Otherwise, why would we have ATP running around in the tissues? ATP should be within the cells and being used to do the cellular function. So our body in its wisdom in being very clever body, <laughs> what it did was it has a lot of ATP receptors on pain system nerves. And so whenever there is ATP in the environment, that causes 
again, same thing, sodium channels connected with the ATP receptors or ATP sensors. So whenever there is ATP, that means there is some tissue damage. That damage is going to cause ATP increase. That ATP would become sensed here and sodium will get into the nerve and nerve will become activated. So acetylcholine, ATP, hydrogen ions, serotonin, bradykinin, histamine, prostenoids, physical damage, thermal damage, chemical damage. There are so many kinds of damages and stresses on the tissue that can cause pain. Now, this is also, I'm not considering yet in this lecture, we'll talk in another lecture, the neuropathic pain where there is actually nothing. It's the nerve itself that is damaged and is not working correctly and causing pain. So we'll talk about that next time. Then there is a concept of spatial and temporal summation. I do not think I have time to discuss that over here. Just in general, sometimes it is possible that something does not cause pain. Some stimulus is not causing pain. But if you keep that stimulus going, either with higher frequency in time or with uh, at a larger area, then the pain would occur. For example, heart, ideally, in theory, Heart is an organ and organs have very few pain receptors. So heart damage should not cause pain. But when a larger set of cells is damaged and a larger number of pain receptors are triggered, that would be called spatial summation, the summation of a larger space of uh, um, you know, triggers, and that causes pain although then we get the referred pain as well. But temporal pain is in time, spatial pain is in, in uh, space. And pain has a character of uh, becoming spatially summed or temporally summed. So we'll talk about that later. I have talked about this in the brain. Neurology is one of the best area that I've done on drbean.com. So uh, check it out, it's actually good. Okay, now, final two topics for today. What is pain pathway? How does the pain actually reach the brain? And number two, how do various substances or neurotransmitters modulate the pain? How do they uh, change the perception of pain? So I'm going to start from the bottom here. So once again, imagine this is um, skin. These are the nerves that we looked for before. I'm going to use the red marker. Imagine there is some trigger over here that is painful deep pressure to crushing pressure or temperature or um, as I discussed other things. I want to discuss a couple of things before I go into this one. Uh, there is a, a term called allodynia. Allodynia is when the pain is felt by a sensation that normally doesn't cause pain. For example, if somebody has a burn on their skin, a touch there will cause pain. Now, normally touch does not cause pain. But if you touch on the burn or an injured area, then the sensation that should not cause pain is causing pain. That is allodynia. And then hyperalgesia is the increased perception of pain. And that can become neuropathic problem as well, or that can be a tissue environment issue as well. So just quick uh, notes there. So now let's start. <clears throat> Imagine that we have a, a pain trigger that was here, which caused the pain sensation to start. If it is an acute pain that has to go, then this is the fiber, otherwise the C fiber. Usually what happens is that A delta fibers get triggered first, so they can tell us that hey, acutely there is a problem, there's a damage about to happen. And then if the damage has occurred, then slow fibers will continue to give us a feeling of pain for hours, days, months, and so on. Now the pain stimulus continues towards from the periphery towards the center, center being the spinal cord and the brain. On the way, the neuron, the pain neuron, this whole thing from here to here is actually one neuron. This neuron has a cell body because eventually the, the neuron is, an, is a cell. So the cell body is present outside of the spinal cord. And many of these neurons are collected together and their cell bodies are present outside. And this is called dorsal root ganglion. Ganglion are collection of neuronal cell bodies outside of the nervous system that is outside of the spinal cord in the brain. 
and the uh, ganglion is usually a collection of many cell bodies that are there. So now the uh, nerve impulse is coming in from here. This is a cell body, the dorsal root ganglion. Then it travels on and finally enters the spinal cord through the dorsal root. Now inside the spinal cord here, this is the dorsal horn or dorsal part of the gray matter. Spinal cord itself is divided into gray matter. Gray matter is the collection of cell bodies inside the spinal cord. They make this butterfly-like structure, and the structure is different at different levels of spinal cord. And then the remaining part of the spinal cord is called the white matter. White matter is usually where the myelinated nerve fibers are going, and unmyelinated as well, but generally it looks white under the microscope, so we call it white matter. That whiteness is because of the myelin sheath. So these are the nerve fibers here, but the nerve bodies are present in the gray matter. So here we have a nerve fiber coming into the spinal cord. I want to zoom in a little and talk about a few things over here. The, if you see here, this fiber is coming here and it is ending. This little U-like thing means that this neuron has finished here. So we call it first order neuron. The first neuron that is carrying the pain sensation has ended in the dorsal horn of the spinal cord. So dorsal horn, this gray matter here, which is collection of neuronal cell bodies, it has a dorsal part and a ventral part. So this is called the dorsal horn. So this nerve fiber has finished here. The second order nerve fiber, that means the next nerve fiber, will start from here and continue taking the sensation of pain. It will cross over through the gray matter of the spinal cord to the other side, and then it will actually come into the ventral part a little, and then finally end up on the lateral part. Lateral part is this side, ventral is this side, dorsal is this side. So then from here, it starts from the dorsal, crosses over. This is why the pain from the left foot is gonna to go to the right brain. Crosses over to the other side, it passes from the ventral side of the gray matter, then it even can pass through some of the white matter over here as well. But anyways, then it reaches lateral side and starts going up. When it starts traveling upwards, so first order finished here, second order started from here and is now going upwards. It will pass through other spinal segments. It is going through the spinal cord. I made this cer cervical se segment just for X here. It passes through the spinal cord, the segments above. Finally, it reaches medulla or the brainstem. Of course, we have medulla, bones, and midbrain, which are parts of the brainstem. Important thing to note over here is that when it reaches medulla, it would give some fibers over here to this reticular formation. We call a scattered set of nuclei present in various parts of the brainstem and the brain, especially brainstem, called reticular formation. Because when you see them under the microscope, they look like dotted pattern of white and gray matter, white being myelinated fibers and the gray matter being neuronal cell bodies. So they are kind of interspersed with each other and that is called reticular fiber formation. So there are some fiber branches given to the reticular formation. Then uh, for the medical students, for the um, medical professionals, uh, medial laminiscus is formed which has fibers on the other side as well, not out of scope of this discussion. Medial laminiscus would finally go to, or the fibers from there would finally then, this is still the second order neuron, will finally go to thalamus and relay there. Thalamus has all sensations either relay there or send connections to thalamus. Thalamus is the big integrator of the sensations. It is a big coordinator for the responses as well. So thalamus is the, the superior headquarter for sensations. So in the thalamus, the sensation would come in, usually in the ventral, uh, postromedial or postrolateral. This one would go to ventral, postrolateral nuclei of the thalamus. From there, if you see here, this is a third order neuron, the third neuron now. This third order neuron, I hope you can now say, it will really go to the appropriate location based on wherever the nerve original fiber is coming from. 
So for example, if the first order neuron are coming from my nose, then after relaying in the thalamus, they would go to the nose. If the first order neuron was in the, let's say my hand, then after relaying in the thalamus, it would go to hand. Right, so not all of them are gonna go here. It really depends where they are coming from and they will go to the appropriate location in the sensory cortex. Of course, there will be limbic system connections as well. And there are actually many more connections on the way as well. In the midbrain, there are branches that are given to the reticular formation too. Then there are branches that are given to even lower centers, hypothalamus as well, reticular formation, and then thalamus, and then other limbic system parts will receive connections. So the result is not only we'll feel the pain, we'll develop emotional response to the pain, and we would also develop an immediate response, phys physical response to pain as well. We'll try to withdraw ourselves, we'll try to go away from the area of pain and so on. So this is the lateral spinothalamic track. What does it, lateral means it is a track that is ascending in the lateral part of the spinal cord, spinothalamic, it tells you the direction of the travel. The impulse is going from spine or spinal cord to thalamus. So you can actually, if it was thalamospinal, which there are some, but let's say corticospinal. Corticospinal means from the cortex to the spinal cord, that will mean a descending because the first word is where the impulse is starting from and the second word is where it is traveling towards. So corticospinal will mean starting from the cortex, going through the spinal cord, that is a descending pathway. And if we're saying spinothalamic, that means it is starting from, or it is originating, not originating, it is traveling from the spinal cord to thalamus upwards, that will be a sensory ascending pathway. Last part, I know that this discussion has become a little longer, I thought half an hour, but anyways, last part. This is really, an important part and we'll dig deeper in the future discussions as well. So here, if you can look at this part, as you can see that there are many neurons over here. And I forgot to talk about this little Lissauer's track. Some of the sensations that are coming in will travel on the same side, one or two segments above and one or two segments below. This is how sensation is actually provided to the local uh, you know, uh, segments to create local reflexes or even to create a spilling of the sensation in the local areas and excite them or help them modulate the system. So this is called uh, Lissauer's track. And then look at these. Do you see this descending pathway, which I actually did not connect anywhere. I would discuss that uh, in a different discussion, but brain would send pathways back as well. So when the brain is receiving sensations, there can actually be pathways that are going to go back. What are they going to do? These pathways are called, in the context of the pain and sensation, these are modulatory pathways. They will come down and change the behavior of the lower systems. So here, I want to go to that diagram that I showed you, but let's just quickly identify the pieces that we'll see there. We'll see there this part, that is a first order neuron finishing. We'll see there this part, which is a second order neuron starting. We'll see there this green part that is the descending pathway coming in for modulating. This is the opioid and caffeine and endorphin pathway. Very important pathway for pain suppression and modulation. And then you would see a red part, which is the internuncial neuron or interneuron. These are usually inhibitory or excitatory for modulation of the sensation as well. So this is the area I'm going to now zoom in over here. So let's look at it just very quickly. When the pain sensation is arriving in the first order, look at the, the neurotransmitters that can be released from this nerve ending. Substance P is released. This substance P will go to the second order neuron. And if you see here, I have a plus sign over here. That means substance P causes excitation of the next neuron. And this will be called excitatory neurotransmitter. Then we have glutamate. Glutamate would also be released from the first order neuron in this synapse. 
and then from there it would go to the second order neuron and excite that. You may have a question here that why do we have to have this little synapse here where the nerve impulse is going to convert from electrical to chemical and then back to electrical? Why do we need that? Why not just connect these two nerves and say impulse can continue going? The reason for connecting them is to allow all of this control in this area. This is a um, checkpoint where we can modulate the sensation that is passing. Impulses, are, let's say somebody is feeling pain and there are impulses passing through this fast. Then the system, this whole system can become ready to allow fast propagation. This is why when there is more pain, it just keeps becoming more and more painful. Or if the pain is too much and we don't think that we can handle it or the brain doesn't think it can handle it, it can try to interrupt here by sending signals from higher up and block the pain. Opioids and caffeines can help do that. Or there is a complete pain gating. If the pain is so severe that a brain thinks we cannot handle it, it would just for, for a temporary just block the pain altogether. So these synapses are used for modulation of the sensation that is traveling from them. So here, back to the neurotransmitter substance P, glutamate, are excitatory. They would cause a second order neuron to continue with the electrical impulse. GABA, if that is released from this nerve, then that would inhibit the next one. So here, this nerve, the first order, if it releases GABA, which it can release under the influence of other uh, uh, modulatory, modulatory pathways, then the next neuron can become hyperpolarized. It can be told to not become too excited and the pain travel can actually become reduced. Pain perception will reduce as well. Then if you see here, this is the higher center, brain sending messages back. And if you see this nerve, is now bringing in messages that can go to this nerve, which is the first order pain neuron, or this nerve, which is the second order pain neuron. So check this out. Brain can cause serotonin release, which will cause the inhibition of the second order and reduction in pain stim uh, uh, travel. And then of course, perception. Norepinephrine can be released here, which is also an inhibitory uh, neurotransmitter for the second order, order neuron. And that would also reduce the travel of the, the number of pain stimuli that can travel from here and reduce hopefully the pain sensation. Then if you see here, this is an interneuron. So there is a complex network within the spinal cord of neurons that are kind of making branches with each other. And they, these are, there are some tiny little neurons that originate in the spinal cord and then they finish within the same spinal cord area. These are called interneurons. So here is an interneuron that is releasing glycine and it is releasing GABA. When it releases glycine, it causes the first order neuron to become inhibited. Under the effect of glycine, this will not release the pain neurotransmitters. And even when there is pain present and even when the stimuli are coming in, they'll come in and they'll die here. So they'll reduce here. Similarly, GABA can be released by the interneurons, which would also be inhibitory for the first order neuron, making them stable. And the impulses would come in here and die down, just like the wave would hit the shore and then die down. The impulse would come here and die down, will not go to the next one. And that is an inhibition or modulation of the pain. Then if you see here, there is opiates, opioids in our own endorphins and caffeines that is released here. And if you see what it is doing is it is, um, inhibiting the second order neuron. So under the effect of opioid, we will feel less pain or no pain. You can see opioid over here as well. So higher centers can send a message down to the lower centers to say, you should release opioids and you should not feel that much pain. What happens is, for example, when you're happy, when you're giggly and laughing, your opioid release and encephaline release increases. Similarly, when you are exercising or when you're running or when you are playing games, your internal opioids or encephaline and endorphins are released that reduces the sensation of pain. So this is the discussion for today. Uh, we will continue with this series. We'll talk about this first, then we'll talk about modulatory pathways, then we'll talk about all the pharmacology of pain. An important topic I wanna uh, uh, address and probably uh, next week is how does pain become chronic? 
why does it become our muscles are now aching forever or uh, our, we have neuropathy doctor said hey you have neuropathy and now we have pain forever what is happening there what is the mechanism of chronicity of the pain so i'm going to discuss that as well that would give you some control in thinking about how to manage it so at the end thank you very much for watching and like, subscribe, and share if you liked it or if you think it can be used by someone and take advantage of this um, link. It is in the description of this video, which gives you access to drbean.com for only $67 one-time payment. And I already have the whole neurology over there. You can actually watch some of these over there as well. And with this, thank you very much. Stay happy, healthy, pain-free, especially chronic pain-free. And uh, I will see you next week. Please like, subscribe, and share. If you would like to support this work as well, there are links in the description to support that. The best is to get advantage and get access to drbean.com. Thank you. See you next time.